Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Yeah. Well, we are excited that you are here. My name is Mark Lodato, and I'm the assistant dean here at the Cronkite School, and I'm very excited to introduce you to Andrew Hayward, who was the president of CBS News from 1996 to 2005. And during that time, CBS News grew significantly in audience, regularly scheduled hours, and profitability. He also spearheaded CBS News' expansion into digital media, which we'll be talking about tonight. And before becoming president, Andrew was the executive producer of the CBS Evening News, and he developed and conceived 48 Hours, the, pro the program that was wildly popular for many years, and he has won 12 National Emmy Awards. We won't list them all. So. <laughs> but today, Andrew helps media companies develop innovative online ventures and profitable digital strategies. He's creating content and services and also helping these companies transform their business to drive growth and revenue in this era of rapid change. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Hayward. Thank you, thank you very much. It's so, great, to, great to be here. We are very excited to have you here. And Andrew, uh, you have, your work has taken you in many different directions, uh, from a very traditional media mindset decades ago to this age of rapid change that we're talking about. Why is this such a good time for students like these to be entering this volatile profession? I think it's because uh, journalism is going to be uh, much more welcoming of entrepreneurship uh, than it was. For many decades, uh, it was relatively unchanging. There, was, there were very solid business models, it's very predictable. You know, somebody like me who spent, you know, 25 years at CBS News practically, that's unheard of today. It's much more, uh, a much more dynamic environment, but I think that the journalism of the future, while it might be trickier to navigate, offers many more rewards for people's individual talents. There'll be much more diversity of voices, uh, there'll be much more room for you to flower based on what you do best as an individual, uh, and lots of different places where you can express your talent and your inclinations. Uh, there's no barrier to entry anymore for somebody who wants to produce content or distribute content. These used to be tightly held oligopolies, and it was much too expensive and difficult to buy a printing press, let alone a television station and a satellite. Now, you could publish your thoughts about this meeting tonight, and they would get worldwide distribution if people were interested in reading them. So that's a huge change. A lot, do you think it's just simply easier today? Or but you also have to create your own niche, I guess, to, to become successful if you go down that entrepreneurial route? Well, I, I think that there's an interesting balance going on. There's a balance anyway in any kind of uh, professional life, especially one where if you start working for a company, between fitting in and standing out. And for many years, I think there was probably too much emphasis in journalism on fitting in and Certainly there were people who stood out and always have been, but you were expected to fit the mold of a particular news organization, and that's still going to be true depending on where you go. We are living in a kind of period of transition where you have still very powerful, rich, well-established media firms doing journalism, and a lot of you will probably end up in places like that. On the other hand, increasingly over time, with the fragmentation of the marketplace, with an abundance of new producers of journalism, including upstart companies that we can talk about, uh, there'll be opportunities uh, for you to be more of an individual or fit into a different culture that's not the standard uh, journalistic one. So let's talk about that for a moment. 20 years ago, the networks were very strong and profitable. Today, it's a much different landscape. What's the greatest threat to the networks today in your mind, the traditional television <coughs> networks? Well, a couple of things have happened. Um, it's happened most dramatically to newspapers, which is that the advertising model that was the underpinning for much of newspapers' revenue has really deteriorated based on competition from digital media. That's less true in television, but the television audience is aging and isn't being replaced by you. So it's really your fault. Uh, it isn't really being replaced by you. What used to happen traditionally for years, um, and, and certainly in the last century, is that people would age into the television watching habits of their parents. So as they got to an age where they suddenly started paying taxes or sending kids to school or having a mortgage, they got interested in civic affairs and started watching the news. New younger people traditionally aren't heavy consumers of news um, until they have a more of a vested interest in society. That doesn't happen anymore. People 
young people care a lot about news, but they don't take on the media habits of their parents. And the median age of the network evening news broadcast is hovering around 60. And that goes for cable news as well. So that is not a prescription for long-term success. So I would say, in a nutshell, in addition to, well, two things, a tremendous explosion in the number of other sources that people can have. So you're no longer dependent on the news. I said two, I'm gonna make it three, that's one. Two, the, the rise of personalized, on-demand experiences. So the, the idea that I'm gonna watch what I want when I watch it, I'm gonna customize news to, to my own needs. And three, I think there's been a failure on the part of mainstream media to create new products and formats that really engage with the next generation. So what would be your advice if you had to walk into NBC Nightly News or, or one of these organizations and say, how do we get these eyeballs back to our products? Well, it's a great question. I don't have a great answer. First of all, I don't think NBC Nightly News should change radically because there are still 20 to 25 million people a night who watch one of the three network evening newscasts. And you literally, first of all, you're performing an important service for them, and you certainly can't afford to alienate them with some radical changes. I think what, what, what NBC and the other mainstream news providers have to do is develop some additional products that really start as digital products, figure out how television fits into that. And they're trying to do that, to be fair. I think it's, it's, it's challenging. And now in that area, unlike in television, they're competing against some pretty compelling startups that seem to have a better sense for what younger consumers want. Which startups are you thinking of most when you... Well, companies like uh, BuzzFeed, which is dramatically expanding its news presence, Vice, uh, Mashable, Mike, Vox. Uh, there, there are quite a few of them. And uh, you know, Vice is interesting. Vice, Vice's main revenue source is not its journalism. It's what's called its branded content. It's content that creates for advertisers. But Vice is doing, even if you just look past the kind of macho, tattooed swagger of its style, Vice is doing old-fashioned enterprise reporting, going to hot spots and doing original reporting. That's you know, a real service. I, I was uh, in Times Square, and I saw an ad, a big billboard. I live in Manhattan. A uh, big billboard for uh, Vice's show on HBO, the second season, and the tagline was, we go there. I found that kind of shocking in that in 2015, that really shouldn't be much of a tagline, but for a news organization to say, we go there and be able to brag about that tells you that they're sort of going back to the future. They're, in a way, despite the patina of newness of Vice, they're really going back to old-fashioned, we go there journalism and showing you something that you couldn't see for yourself. Since you left CBS News, you've worked with a lot of startups and I would say more aggressive companies, perhaps. Is there a mentality difference in, in that world than, say, the world you left with the, with the larger corporations? Yeah, in a nutshell, the startups, by definition, are risk takers. Uh, that's why I said it's going to be a more entrepreneurial atmosphere. So at a startup, you are making a bet on a big idea and you're going all in on it. If you have a successful business and you're in a big corporation, you can't, it's very hard to jeopardize that. You not only have years of habit and doing things kind of the same way, you try to do them a little better every year, but it's very hard to disrupt yourself. So the startups are actually coming at it with a fresh perspective, which gives them an advantage. Although, in fairness, and, you know, it's not clear that any of the companies I've named is going to be the news company of the future, although Vice does have substantial investment from mainstream companies and a very large valuation. Uh, you were recently quoted in Frank Rich's article in New York Magazine about the future of the anchor position uh, as we move forward. And you had some really interesting ideas there. And one that struck me was this concept that really a decision was made decades ago to, in essence, invest in, glorify the person who sits on the anchor desk, perhaps more so than the content that's being provided. Uh, can you explain that decision decades ago, and then perhaps what would be different today if we went down a different route? Sure, so <clears throat> if we take anchor people for granted, whether we picture Walter Cronkite or Ron Burgundy, we still know what an anchor man is. But that was kind of an accident, it was an invention. And you know, after World War II, when television news came into its own, there was no such thing as an anchor man. And it was you know, a format that was cooked up by producers to tie together different elements. It really started, uh, in radio in World War II with the Edward R. Murrow and so-called Murrow's Boys, and almost all of them were men, in fact, and they would do a roundup from different cities of things that were going on in Europe 
uh, that at the time of the war, and Murrow would kind of tie that together. And later that became, you know, different people take credit for the term anchorman. But over time, so in the early days, and certainly in the case of Cronkite, after whom this wonderful institution is named, Cronkite earned his authority. Not only was he a very good reporter, but he really was a touchstone for Americans during times of peace and war, crisis and stability. He was somebody, he became known as the most trusted man in America, Uncle Walter. He really played a, an amazing role in the culture. But so I consider that, it's what I call earned authority. Now what we have in the hundreds and hundreds of anchors around the country is asserted authority. They assert the authority just by creating all the trappings of being an anchor person, the, the big desk, the lighting, the perfect hair, the great voice, um, and all of the habits that anchor people have that the next generation rightly makes fun of. It's hard to know how any anchor person can take him or herself too seriously once John Stewart and Stephen Colbert are finished imitating them. But the, so I think that what's odd is that people have the ambition to be anchors, but it's not really odd because if somebody said to you, well, you can either go stand out in the rain, or maybe here in Phoenix, although it did rain a bit today, in the hot sun, you know, being a reporter, or you can sit on your tush in the studio and make five times as much money and throw to the reporter and say, I think I'll sit on my tush in the studio and make five times as much money. So the idea that I raised in New York Magazine is what if the incentive had been different? What if in the invention of television news, we had glorified reporting and that's what you graduated to? What if we said, you know, reading the prompter isn't that hard. What's hard is going out and unearthing facts, finding things that other people don't know, and then presenting them in a cogent, coherent way, and that's where you're going to make the big money, and that's where you're going to get famous, we would have a much better world. Then people would say, oh, they're making me start as an anchor, but I can't wait to get out there and be a reporter. You know, we're a long way from that, but I do think what is going to happen is that, there, again, it's going to take time, because local news and network news are still very powerful, but over time, and my, my prediction is that the traditional anchor role is going to give way to earned authority again, where the people who present the news are going to be knowledgeable specialists who have to actually establish that they know what they're talking about. If you, if, one of the things that's striking about Vice, let's say, is that unlike the voice of God anchor who's talking down at you, literally from a big desk or through the, through the camera, the guys on Vice, and they are mostly guys, um, have a more peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the audience. So the, the value proposition is, you went to school, you went to the factory, you went to your cubicle, I went to the building collapse. And now it's my job. And I, it's not that I'm smart or handsome or have a better hairdo. I'm just, that's what I did and I'm here to tell you what I found out. That's different from the kind of phony authority that we've invested in our anchors. Do you think it makes sense then for an outlet or a network to say, if that's the direction we're going to go, should we just jet there right now? Sort of leapfrog over the so, anchor mentality. So I don't want to sound like you know too much of a corporate citizen, but I think that would be very scary. I think the uh, you 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 don't want it's a, in television news, which I know better than print. Television news, it's way easier to chase people away than it is to attract them. You know, you can chase people away very very fast. It takes a long time to attract and build an audience. And I think if all of a sudden you know, you've been watching your favorite anchor and she's not there that next, you know, you watched her on Friday and she said, have a, have a nice weekend on Monday, she's not there and you're in some multi-reporter format. I think that would be very alienating to a lot of people. The people who watch television news like it. One of my jokes, uh, it was a bittersweet joke when I was at CBS was, the people who are keeping us alive are killing us. And what I meant by that is, they're keeping us alive because they're watching but they're killing us because we can't really innovate in a radical way because they like things the way they are. And in fact, it's not an accident that the evening newscasts are uncannily similar to what they were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, they really haven't innovated much. So I suspect that what you're going to see is innovation in other organizations, on other platforms, or perhaps within these organizations, but not in their traditional programs. Sort of a catch-22. You, so. you can't innovate because you risk forcing them away. And, but if you don't, they're slowly going to go away. So another way to think about it is you protect your core, but you go for more, and you go for more by creating something new in a different place. I would argue that local news is suffering from that even at a greater uh, rate than national networks in that philosophy and trying to hold on to what, what they still have. Uh, is there a scenario where you see content changing on the local level that could help local news really survive and thrive today? You know, I've been predicting 
trouble for local news for a lot of years, and it hasn't really happened. So don't listen to whatever I say next, because I obviously have no idea what I'm talking about. But I'll say it again anyway. Um, I, I think it inevitably local news will decline unless it changes, because local news for a long time had, and still has to a large degree, a comfortable model competing against, as they see it, two other stations in the market, maybe three. Um, there's a tremendous influx of money every couple of years from political advertising, which is a big bonus for local stations. And a lot of people still like it. Every Pew survey of news puts local news at the top of where people get their news. So local news is popular. It's still viable. There have been a lot of budget cuts in local news. There are fewer resources. But local news stations haven't really been held to account. What, what I think is going to be the problem, again, is what I said before, the next generation is not going to gravitate to local stations. I can't imagine that the people you know, in this room you know, want to make sure that we're done in time so you get home and you know, watch the 11. By the way, we will be done in time for you to watch the 11. But the, uh, it, it's, it's just not baked into the habits of the next generation. So while there's been a surprising degree of longevity and stability, they, there is a cliff ahead, and I, and I think the lack of innovation in local news, and to some degree network news, is pretty shocking considering the challenges, but I believe there will be a change there, and in fact, that change is going to be affected by the people in this room, because as you go out in the world, you are going to be telling stories differently in the local news formats. Unless local news changes, then the only people left watching it will be the ones who think that the anchorman and the weatherman are actually friends. <laughs> So what's the best strategy then for a local news executive? Do we just try to figure out how to get our stories in front of this younger audience or in a di different platforms, different ways, Snapchat, things like that? Or is it more about the content that we're covering today? Well, I think you do have to have a deep understanding of digital news gathering, production, consumption. So I think you do have to create products for those um, platforms, and what's traditionally happened, as you know, is that local stations would just put their same video on different platforms and called that a digital strategy. That's not a digital strategy. That's just, um, you know, there's some pejorative word for it, but basically you're just, you know, reposting it elsewhere, and it's not, uh, that's not ultimately going to be effective because you're in a different frame of mind when you're on the run consuming, you know, little news nuggets as opposed to watching your, your, your TV. But, so I, I do think that that, that is going to be important. My theory is that and I'm, I'm actually, one of the reasons I'm here at ASU is to actually discuss these ideas with the fantastic faculty here, and is, is that I think there will be... Huh. There, there we go. Now we're back. There, there will be a competitive <laughs> advantage to stations that can form that can actually create deeper engagement, even with older viewers, by covering issues that are more compelling. You know, people say that local stations cover too many murders and fires, and they do. And people, and I think that's the conventional wisdom is, oh, well, that's just because it's tabloid or sensational. The real reason you see so many murders and fires is because it's so easy. It's so easy. You listen to the police scanner, and you just go chase that, and it looks like something new, even though most murders and most fires are really not terribly interesting, except for the people to whom they happened, or maybe the people who live next door. I think that we're going to head for something, a state, there's a potential to invent something, which I'm calling the social scanner, which is to use social media to actually uh, tap into issues that are fundamentally important to a community, and to create more of a two-way peer-to-peer relationship with the viewers. And if there's potential there, that could actually become a competitive advantage for some stations that better serve their communities. And by the way, there are plenty of stations in America that do a really good job, and they're doing a lot of original reporting and investigative reporting. I, don't, I certainly don't mean to condemn all local news. I just think that local news in general, and I travel a lot around the country, tends to be too formulaic and you know, tends to try, to try to please everybody. It ends up not really uh, serving the community as well as it potentially could. One thing, as you know, that we're working hard to uh, employ here is the concept of creating content in a university setting that is of value, great value, to the community through efforts like Cronkite News and News 21, our bureaus in Los Angeles and, and Washington, D.C. Is that, in your opinion, a viable model? And it's okay to say no, but is that something that could help sort of rectify this problem of enough valuable content in local and regional newsrooms? You know, 
I think it's, I think what you're doing here is fantastic. And I think it's a testament to certainly the students and the faculty and to the leadership here. But this is a pretty extraordinary place. You know, if we had an ASU in every market doing this kind of thing, maybe I'd worry less. The, we don't. And I tend to feel, here comes, you know, the commercial for capitalism. I like the marketplace to solve these problems. I, I actually believe that if a station can carve out a competitive advantage and make more money by serving the community better, that would be the ideal solution, rather than relying on a nonprofit institution like a major university to do it. So please don't stop. And I hope maybe we can set some examples here that others will follow, which would be great. But ultimately, what you want is something, that the ideal scenario is to do good and do well. We want to do good for the country, and we want the stations to do well, so they continue to do good for the country, serve their role in the democracy. So I want to switch gears a little bit, because it's not often in, in our must-see Monday setting where we get to talk about Hollywood. And in a few weeks, there's going to be a new movie out called Truth, which looks back at Dan Rather and a controversy he faced and a CBS producer. And this movie is going to star Robert Redford and Kate Blanchett. And uh, you were at CBS News at that oh, time. You very, were very much so uh, in a leadership position. And that, is there a question buried in there? <laughs> no. What is it? Well, the question is, take us back yeah, to Rathergate. Well, it's too painful to take you back, but I will say something about, about the movie because I think it would be disingenuous not to mention it. it's coming out very soon, and there'll be some publicity around it. So this was an extremely painful and difficult period, not, not just for me, but for CBS News in general. But I'm going to try to present it super fairly, even though it'll be pretty obvious what my point of view is. So th back in the 2004 election, uh, just before, a couple months before, there was an investigative piece on 60 Minutes 2, reported by Dan, produced by a woman named Mary Mapes, um, that talked about uh, George Bush's Na Air National Guard record during the Vietnam War. It was pretty well known that, like a lot of privileged young men, he had used pull to get into the Air National Guard, and reasonably well known that he had sometimes you know, goofed off a little bit, but was the, the, the dynamite that was new here was um, memos from his commanding officer complaining about the influence that was used to protect him and about his essentially dereliction of duty. That, so that was the new hot item in this, in this report. Uh, and they showed the memos and all that. So the day after the report came out, there was a, a litany of accusations that the memos were forgeries. And it was, like now, a very polarized time in the country between left and right. So at first, it felt as though this was just a you know, politically motivated attack. But actually, it turned out there, was a, you know, there were a lot of very serious questions raised about the memos. And it turned out that you know, it wasn't clear that the producer had done a good enough job of authenticating the memos. And to this day, 11 years later, uh, they, their provenance is still in doubt. They have never, you know, if, if Dan were here, he would say, well, no one's ever proved they were fake. And that's what he would say, and he said that. Um, uh, but you know, his critics would say, well, no one's ever proved they were real either. So what, so what happened then, there was a giant scandal. It was an outside investigation. Uh, the producer was fired, along with some other executives involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the story. Dan and I both stayed at CBS News for you know, a, a bit long. I stayed another year. He stayed longer than that. But he, he left the evening news during this period. And this movie is based on a memoir by the producer. So this is her story. And the thesis of the movie is that, in fact, the story was true. I'm a, they do deal, I mean, I haven't seen the movie, but from what I understand, they deal with the controversy, but the story was true. And Dan and Mary were basically railroaded out because of political pressure. The idea is that you know, the, this was corporate, corporate, craven corporate stooges caving into political pressure. So the interesting issue, I have no idea whether it'll be a good movie, and I certainly am not going to urge you to see it, but um, I mean, especially because I'm the bad guy in it, because I was the president of CBS News, so I stand in for all corporate power. You know, they don't, the people above me don't get into the movie. They, it's easier to have one. But the, the, the interesting issues are, you know, the difference between truth and facts. Um, is the underlying, if the underlying story is indeed true, can, does it matter whether the, the memos were real or not. Now, I would argue, this is now my opinion, very much it does, that you, the heart of journalism is actually getting it right, and that you know, it's not our job to reveal truth. Our job is to discover facts that add up to something that, that is true. So for me, the flaws in the memo were insurmountable, fatal flaws. However, as I said, it'd be fair, Dan and Mary would say that this was 
a witch hunt, that, the, uh, that in fact the story was true. There was no way to completely verify the memos, but that, that the story was, you know, the backlash was politically motivated. So you should see the movie, and, but if you see the movie, I would also urge you to actually read about the controversy and not just, because the other issue that's interesting for a journalism school is, you know, the Hollywood version, even if it's based on a true story, is never, it's always made more dramatic. It's a dramatization. Um, so you have to please look at it with a critical eye as the news consumers that you are. The only good news is I'm being played by Bruce Greenwood, who's a pretty good looking guy. <laughs> Otherwise, let's move on to the next thing. No, ask me whatever you want. I'm kidding. But it's, clearly it's difficult to dive back into this years later for you. And it well, was it was a really giant good. screw up. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was in charge. And, it was people I worked very closely with and I'm friends with to this day lost their jobs and I could easily have lost mine. Yeah, it was, it was a low moment. Uh, I don't, interestingly, and again, my opinion, I, I actually have been amazed in my very long career in network news how little political interference there was from above. The conventional wisdom is, oh, the companies are always cracking down and telling you what to say. In all the time, all the stories I was involved with, including many controversial ones, I never got pressure from the bosses to do or not do a particular story, and not even from the sales department. Like, would you do a story about you know, a defective tire and there might have been an advertiser? They knew that was the price of having a credible news division. So I actually think you know, this, that's not the big problem in, in, in news today. I think a bigger problem is the um, self-censorship, not from political pressure, but from commercial pressure. The, the pressure to have high ratings and to have high circulation is the main reason behind many of the things that we don't like about the news. It's not politically motivated pressure, in my view. Well, if you look back to that situation and, and the fallout for Dan Rather, from, for Dan Rather, and in years since, we've had uh, challenges for other top anchors, obviously Brian Williams well, so recently that, that's as a, well. Well, that's a great example. So Brian Williams um, lost his job. You know, he was the number one anchor man, and he lost his job. He's coming back on MSNBC next week. Uh, but... You know, what was Brian Williams accused of? He wasn't accused of saying anything on the nightly news that wasn't true or misreporting a story. He was accused of exaggerating on uh, talk shows or exaggerating some of his um, you know, trips and some of his reporting trips, things that had happened to him. But again, this is, you know, we hold, and rightly so, we hold our anchors, we hold our journalists, public journalists like Brian Williams to a very, very high standard, and he paid a terrible price. I think he's going to come back and do well and build himself back, and I'm glad he's coming back. And NBC, I think, was enlightened not to just jettison him, but you know, that is, you know, we have, we hold these anchor men in, in, in an exalted position. So exaggerating or fibbing on The Tonight Show can be a fatal mistake. Well, these evening shows today are very attractive for news personalities. They can build their own... The late night shows. The late right. night shows, uh -huh. exactly. They can help news personalities build their presence, uh, help them relate to a younger audience. I mean, is it just simply intoxicating that they can't stay away? I think, you know, I'd like to think you can be charming without exaggerating your exploits. And, and uh, I, I think the... You know, Brian is, I don't know him well, but I know him and I admire him greatly and he's made enormous contributions to journalism. And this is just a very unfortunate and sad incident. And I'm, as I said, I'm glad he's coming back. I do think you're onto something important, which is we are going to, this actually illustrates my point that we're moving to a more human type of interaction and relationship with you know, our journalists. Instead of this revered godlike figure, it's going to be somebody who you know, who has more aspects to her or his personality, who isn't afraid to show them. You know, again, in the early days of television news, they were very self-conscious back in Cronkite's thing before about the lights and the makeup. They were unconscious about being associated with show business. So they built all these trappings in of seriousness and earnestness. We live in a world that's less earnest, more ironic. Um, it's not an accident that Jon Stewart became not just a fantastic comedian, but a major news source, because he was seen by many people, certainly in your generation, as being able to get to the heart of the matter in a way that mainstream journalists don't allow themselves to do. So we're going to move into a world not where news people become comedians, but I think it's going to be a little looser and more real, which I think is good. And again, that speaks to the notion of a more entrepreneurial environment where some blend of personality and journalistic ability will be the drivers of success. So in just a couple minutes, we're going to open up the floor for your questions. So please have those ready. We're looking forward to that. But before we do, I want to touch 
touch upon the current presidential campaign for a moment. I, I think, uh, it, as you mentioned earlier today, we often hear about issues, 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 and what we get is a horse race. Can we expect any improvement in coverage this year? So I think you all know what, what Mark's referring to, the, that journalists always say every time there's an election, this time, we're really going to focus on the issues. That's the real public service. People understand what's really at stake. And then it ends up, you know, Mary is three points ahead of Bill. Um, and we're, we're in that cycle again, although this time it's kind of fascinating because you have this Trump and, and, and on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders phenomenon. So you actually do have a fascinating horse race right now with these two outsiders, uh, in the case of Trump dominating the polls, in the case of Sanders coming up rapidly against a powerful Democratic frontrunner. So that does represent something going on in the country, a kind of disaffection with politics as usual, with the usual rhetoric. So that's a real story, and I, I certainly think the coverage of it is legitimate and, and exciting. But as the campaign settles into the long haul between now and 14 months from now, I hope that there's also coverage of issues, because if we don't do it, no one else is, then we're leaving it up to the politicians. And the politicians are only going to present their very, very tendentious view of the issues that either makes them look good or their opponents look bad. So it's up to journalists to really dis find differences and help voters understand what, what they're getting. I'm actually uh, a research affiliate at the MIT Media Lab, and we're working on a project there that's going to allow us to track the course of issues and ideas through the campaign across politicians, the press, and the public, and see how they're aligned and not aligned. But we'll see. I mean, every year people say it. Every year we revert. Right now, the horse race is pretty darn fascinating. I and I'm sure we're all going to be watching the debate tomorrow. And tonight, we're competing against Monday Night Football. But I'm sorry, on Wednesday. But uh, Wednesday, I would not want to be doing this event, because I'm sure everybody's eyes are going to be glued to the uh, Republican debate. I still think one of the greatest jobs is to be on the campaign trail with with a candidate and, and watching the process day by day. And we actually have a recent alum of ours to graduate just a couple years ago as an embed for NBC News, Vaughn Hilliard, and did right. a terrific job. But watching him, I'm wondering, how do you get fresh information every day and not just feel forced to be spoon-fed by the campaign? That's a giant problem. And, and I, it's one reason that I think campaign, the campaign coverage is less interesting than it should be because and then nothing against the embeds, they do a great job, but it's very hard to, you're working a beat and you're developing sources and you've done it, and you know, trying to elicit original information. And there is, there's kind of a pack tendency, you know, one of the phenomena in, in traditional journalism that I don't like, and the reason it isn't better than it is, is that people do what I call playing for a tie. You worry more about being beaten than you do about actually winning. So uh, what I mean by winning is, I don't mean the ratings, I mean coming up with something original and important and valuable to your constituents. Um, you're, yes, you'll get praised if you do that, but you're really going to get punished if, you, if the other guy has something that you didn't. So there's a tendency to kind of a leveling out of the coverage where people, I mean, it is kind of unbelievable if, how same, you know, the sort of the survival of the samest rather than survival of the fittest. And that's not good for America. And again, I think that's going to change with upstarts coming in and really challenging the mainstream. If, 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 if consumers like you start gravitating to BuzzFeed or Mashable for political coverage and show no interest over time in watching television, television is going to have to adjust to that. All right, we are ready for your questions. What we're going to ask is that you come up to the microphone right here, and we can go ahead and even line up and do so if need be, and we will get the process started. We have our first question. Hi, my name is Lahela. Um, I was just wondering how a reporter can have something original and talk to the sources when these days it's a lot harder to get to the center of it. In the days of Walter Cronkite, they could, you know, rush through to the dark forests with the actual troops, but these days it's a lot of press corps. We're going to keep you here nice and safe where you don't blow up. So how do you get that answer you're looking for when you're not allowed to go as far as you used to? Was everybody able to hear your colleague's question there? Okay. So, so I, I, th I think, you know, there's been an evolution of this. Um, so the short answer is, uh, while it's difficult, it can be done. In fact, uh, CBS News' national security correspondent, David Martin, 
almost never leaves the Pentagon, and he somehow beats his competition every single time. So he's, he's inside the office building, he, and, and yet he's such a good reporter with such good sources that he knows who to call, he's worked them for years, and if, even if there's like, if you're covering a war across, uh, halfway across the world, even though you have people there, like as, as we did during you know, the, the Iraq war, we had this you know, amazing set of embeds, which was great, but you still needed David as well to supplement their information with what his sources were telling him that wasn't the official version. But in Viet Vietnam was relatively freewheeling, as you say, um, and reporters were really given extraordinary access to go to the battle scenes, and a lot of uh, military commanders then felt that that was a mistake, and that that contributed to the anti-war movement, to the disenchantment of the American public with the Vietnam War. So there was a long period of retrenchment and restriction, like what you're describing. Then, when we, then in the more recent Iraq War, there was a turnaround in policy, and there extraordinary access and also enhanced by modern technology where you could actually go live from the battlefield. And I think it was actually very smart on the part of the Pentagon because you saw these amazing young women and men who are out there, you know, serving their country and it put a human face on people who a lot of, you know, certainly the elites don't often get to see. So I think, I, I think that increasingly now because technology is so much less um, onerous, you know, yeah, it's light, it's easy, and there's so many people, you know, there's so many one-man bands, one-woman bands out there. I think it's going to be harder to hold people behind the red line, but one of the problems that, you know, in politics is that you see the, camp the complaints around the Hillary Clinton campaign is that it's just too managed, too stage managed, too restricted. So it's always going to be a blend of, you know, official access and unofficial aggressiveness. Thank you. Hi, Ethan Millman. Uh, you touched earlier on the idea that we're getting looser and more human with our journalism, and as we're entering this next era of, of multimedia journalism, whatever, what have you, what do you think the process is going to be over this next era to, as we get to that looser, more human feel? Well, I think it's going to depend on what path you choose to take. It used to be there was you know, one, one path up the mountain, so guess what? You took it. Well, now you have the advantage, but it's also the scary situation where there are 100 paths up the mountain, and there are circuitous, twisty paths. So you'll have to use your own intelligence and, intelligence and, 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 and insight and instinct in whatever organization you start at. It, it goes back to that dichotomy I mentioned earlier, Ethan, between fitting in and standing out. So it, you know, some places are going to insist that you fit a certain mold until, and it's going to take a little bit longer for your special qualities to shine through, potentially. Other places are going to you know, welcome your special quality a lot sooner, but they may not pay as well, they may not have as big you know, distribution network or as big an audience. So I, I think my prediction is that over time, we're going, you know, the, these traditional, very formulaic TV programs uh, are going to give way to a looser world where you're going to have to be, and this is what's great about the training you're all getting here, adept at, you know, photography. You don't have to be great at everything, but you have to be knowledgeable about and competent in not just reporting, but photography, videography, editing, infographics, and you're going to have to be kind of a multiple threat that can, that can tailor the reporting to the platform and the story in a way that also allows your individual talents to flower. So instead of just being, you know, it's, it's encouraging, instead of being a cog, uh, you know, you'll be, a, you know, a distinctive part that, that's, that's irreplaceable. That's the goal. The goal is to go from being kind of a generic cog to being something that has a special distinctive identity, because then you'll be able to have more options over how you spend your time. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name's Daniel Pearl, and um, my question was, with the way that cable news has covered politics, um, particularly in presidential elections, would you say that they're somewhat at fault with the people's disaffection with everyday politics that you described? Daniel, in what sense? That they, that they, they create controversy or that they deal with incremental developments? What, what's your beef with cable? I'm not disagreeing. That, I want to make sure I understand your question. That they sometimes don't try to uncover things about politicians that need to be uncovered for the public good, that they sort of contribute to politics as usual. Yeah, so I, 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 again, I hope you heard what Daniel asked. I, I don't, wouldn't just blame cable for that. I think mainstream media in general um, isn't really tough enough on politicians. And again, I don't mean phony, cheap, showbiz, adversarial toughness of just sounding like, you know, shouting a question. But to your point, 
you know, digging for real differences, contradictions, cha you know, changes in policy over time that might expose hypocrisy or opportunism on the part of a politician. That's a lot harder to do than just to cover the latest development and cover the latest poll. Again, it goes back to the police scanner. It's a lot easier you know, to, for the 11 to run to a fire than it is to dig out a fresh story that nobody's heard about. So I think the, it's not that it's laziness, it's that you have these, there's a tremendous demand for content and material, and you have these machines that have to keep on cranking out news and content, and a lot of the time the reporter is live all day. When are you gonna actually work the phone? Going back to your colleague's question about, you know, what do you do to get beyond the limited access that an institution might give you? When do you have time to break a story on the campaign trail or, or anywhere else? So I think, Again, that's what's really gonna change it is when you, the audience, we, the audience, demand it, and we reward the organizations that do it. Just as we rewarded, you know, whatever you reward Reddit for, or BuzzFeed for, or Jon Stewart for, the, you think about the reasons you consume the sites and the people that you gravitate to, that is the law of supply and demand at work. And, you know, we're gonna have much more variety, which is good. You'll have a lot more options of where you get your news and, and what it's like. But I think the mainstream media, as I said earlier, is going to have to respond in order to survive over, over time. But it's, you know, it's still got a lot of people who like it the way it is. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Karam Gavsi. I'm a journalism major. And I just want to ask you, uh, well, I must start this off. Uh, you worked a very prestigious position in a high position for like a number of years. Uh, can you briefly detail what it took for you to acquire such a high position with CBS? Lied and cheated my way to the top. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, <clears throat> so I really started at the very bottom. I graduated. From, I wasn't smart. Like I wasn't smart enough the way you were to find your professional direction as an undergraduate. So I, I went to a very good college, but I just was a liberal arts major. I had no idea what I was going to do. And then I got interested in. So I didn't even try out for the paper, which I wish I had done. But I got interested when I graduated in television news and local news in particular. So I had to start really at the bottom. In fact. I replaced a kid who was leaving for college. Uh, that's how I got the job. This high school kid left for college, that's how I got it. But I worked my way up, it was an old-fashioned apprenticeship, and I think, I guess if I you know, had any advice, I guess it's what you're asking for, it's that even in every job I had, even the most menial ones, I tried to do those well and then figure out a way to exceed expectations. Uh, to do something special. Again, it goes back to what I was saying um, earlier, which is if you can figure out what's special about you, I'm not saying I'm so special, but what's special about you that you do particularly well. If you think about, you can think about your career as kind of three circles. You know, one is your passion, another is your talent, and another, another is the opportunity. And picture those circles, inter it's the area where those three intersect. And you really need all three to have a successful career, right? Because if, if there's something you're passionate about and there's an opportunity but you don't have the talent, that's obviously not gonna work out. If there's talent, opportunity, but no passion, you're not gonna enjoy it and so on. You get it. Any two are not enough. So if you look for those opportunities and figure out what is it that you do that's special, and again, you have to fit in, but figure out a place where you also can stand out. And I think I was pretty good at going to places where I could, not immediately, but over time, make a difference. It's a very, very competitive business on both sides of the camera. Um, so figuring out where those three circles intersect, I think, is what I think about. Thank you. That was very insightful. Dean Lodato, Mr. Hayward. Uh, my name is Trevor, and I'm writing an article for tonight's event, so I was wondering if I could record your response. Sure. Thank you. I, I assume this whole thing is on the record, right? I was, <laughs> yes. I was warned it was a tweet-a-thon. <laughs> My question is, in the decades since you left CBS News, do you think the threat to stories has become more company-focused, or do you think it's still due to ratings? And if it's the former, uh, which do you think is more dangerous? I just missed the first part of your question. In the decades since I left CBS News, do I think the what of stories? Do you think the threat to stories being run has become more company-focused, or do you think it is still primarily due to what stories will get the highest ratings? Well, I think company-focused and the highest ratings are probably the same thing, right? Meaning. If, if I understand your question correctly, Trevor, are you, are you asking me, do I think that, that the stories are more ratings driven than they were before, or less? Um, yes, in a sense. Okay, I don't, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, I want to make sure I understand what you're asking me. So, I would, no, I, th I, think, 
I actually think there's all, ratings have always been important. They certainly have been for, the, for, for decades. The, the real change there happens you know, in, in, in the last century, really in the, in the 80s, where you know, before that, believe it or not, network news divisions didn't have to be profitable. They were kind of lost leaders that lent prestige to the network, and the network made money in other things. And then there was, I won't bore you with it, but there were all sorts of corporate changes, and the, so all the network news divisions now are expected to make a profit, and, and there's a tremendous emphasis on ratings, on ratings competition. That's certainly true at the, at, at the local level, too. So I don't, I don't think it's anything new. I don't think that's gotten worse. Um, I, I think that's, that's, that, that's always been the case. I do think what's harder now than it was, even, even harder than it was 10 years ago, there were plenty of problems then, is that there's tremendous financial pressure on the resources that news organizations have. So, the, you know, so you're being asked often, especially at the local level, to do more with less. And that obviously is not good for the public. The good news is it's become significantly cheaper to actually produce and distribute news, which opens up an opportunity to actually do more without having to spend a lot of money, and that's going to be good for the public. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, my name is Garrison Murphy. Um, you mentioned uh, um, news sources such as, or news media outlets such as Vice and BuzzFeed and Mashable, um, especially in Vice's case. Do you think that um, Vice is more like alternative and youthful, more unprofessional image and past will hamper their ability to become a um, trusted news source, which it seems what they, seems like what a lot of them want to become at some point? Too early to say. Um, <clears throat> there is a question whether, you know, as Vice becomes bigger and you know, more, even more successful, how long can it continue to portray itself as an upstart? I mean, upstarts, by definition, define themselves in adversity, right? They define themselves by being different from the mainstream to the extent that Vice becomes, you know, even more popular and, and is on more platforms and attracts more people, and certainly because Vice's main source of revenue, as I said earlier, is branded content, creating content for advertisers, there may at some point be, be, be some tension there. Um, but Vice has done a brilliant job of marketing itself as, you know, rough, tough alternative. It grew out of the Montreal alternative music scene. It was a music magazine originally, and then this entire media empire has, uh, has, has grown up. So. Um, but it is, I think it's a really, it's a smart insight on your part, which is that you know, as you become big and as you become, you know, in effect, part of the media establishment and the media mainstream, do you have to start looking over your shoulder at the next one who actually takes on the mantle of the disruptor and the upstart? Great. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Yvette Moliari. And um, I was going to ask, uh, in the age of humanistic peer-to-peer -peer oriented news, do you think reporters still hold the responsibility of not showing their biases by their personal media accounts and what they post on their own, or is it changing? The notion of ob objectivity of journalists who don't have any personal opinions is actually an aberration in the history of American journalism. But it didn't start that way. It's a kind of a... Again, I'm not sure about this, but I think it was really a function of, of the rise of television as a mass a licensed by the government, the stations were, not the networks, licensed by the government medium. Uh, but it's relatively, that's a relatively new thing. I think in the new world, we're going to be moving more to transparency than so-called objectivity. So meaning that reporters, and again, I hate to use the word bias, but reporters will share should share any information about themselves that will allow their readers or viewers to make intelligent judgments about the journalism. So if, um, and I think social media is perfect for that. So rather than have this sterile, sanitized world where reporters pretend to be robots or zombies who don't actually you know, get involved in society, I prefer the idea of uh, transparency, authenticity, which creates much more, again, use the word peer-to-peer, -peer, a much more authentic relationship between the consumer and the reporter. Not everybody agrees with this. There are certainly many journalists and traditional news executives who say, no, that's, you know, we don't want, uh, you know, a world where everybody has got an opinion, there's real value. But I, I, I think, you know, to me, fairness is, I, I don't like the word balance, because that implies 
everything has to be 50-50, which I don't think is true at all. But fairness is a fundamental journalistic value. And I think the, we should be able to judge that somebody is being fair, especially in the news gathering process. If you're fair in your news gathering and you're open to all comers and all ideas, and then you let the facts lead you to a certain conclusion that you can then document and you lace in anything about your background or your other experience that might be relevant, I think that's a healthy model. Thank you. It's an interesting time, though, because we see so many local news personalities, at least, feeling the pressure to engage on social media today. And for some of them, that's really difficult because they've been coming from a traditional space where you don't do that. And I don't throw my opinion out there. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's very hard. And, I, and again, I don't think we, I'm not sure we want to be in a world where the local anchor is, you know, giving you her or his opinion about abortion. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I don't think we necessarily need that. But I would say if, um, if the local anchor is married to a prominent anti-abortion activist, that might be information worth disclosing, at least on the station's website. So somebody say, okay, good to know. Hi, my name's Tian Bischoff, and um, my question is, what's your view on, uh, what's your take on what CBS is doing now with CBSN and the revamp of CBS This Morning with the new anchors? And just where do you see the future, particularly of CBS and what they're doing right now? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm a you know, hometown fan of CBS. I'm an alumnus and was very proud to work there. I, I think the, um, the, the CBSN, in case you don't know, is a 12-hour a day or so digital network that, that CBS News launched, about a, I guess, about a year ago. Uh, and the CBS Morning Program uh, has had an overhaul. In fact, one of the anchors, Charlie Rose, is being honored here on the 19th of October. You should definitely go to that if you can. So I, I think the CBS Morning Program has done a great job, and it actually illustrates one of the points we've been talking about, because for years, including, I'm sorry to say, when I was there, you know, CBS was not successful in the morning and was, and was sort of chasing the same model as the other two. Now, CBS News is still number three in the morning. The other two, Good Morning America and Today, are more successful financially and, and in ratings. But, but CBS News decided to differentiate itself and really emphasize what it thought was its strength. So going back to my three circles of your you know, strength, passion, and opportunity, their strength is news coverage, and that's what they are stressing uh, on the morning program, and, I, and they've had fairly significant growth. They're still quite, quite far behind, but they're doing something that is actually more in line with the DNA that we were all very proud of at CBS News. I haven't watched the digital network that much. I think it's fine. I think it's, you know, we haven't gotten into it here, but most of you, I would wager don't consume a ton of linear news, meaning, you know, a, you know, starts at point A and goes to point D. My guess is that you're very, very active, savvy news consumers who jump around, you know, from site to site, from app to app. And so the notion of a, you know, linear news service, it's, it's challenging. And, you know, 24-hour cable news has had its struggles because it was a great model for several decades, is now facing challenges. So I think CBS has to think about how to balance linear coverage on the, news, on, on the digital network with a, in an on-demand world. We're moving to an on-demand, over-the-top world. Thank you. Sure. Hello, I'm Sloan McGowan, journalism student here, and I was just wondering, where, you, where do you want to see journalism in like five years? Not like where you think it's going to be, but where, where do you want to see viewers get their news and where it is? Well, I, I, I think whether I want to or not, viewers are going to be getting their news from a, a broad array of sources. You know, I would like to see some of these, if not all of these upstarts, succeed so that there's a, and, and, and develop viable business models um, so that there is, you know, tremendous variety. Um, I, I think we already see people, you know, sophisticated news consumers consuming news from other countries and from other news providers. I think more of that would be great. Um, and the main thing is I'd like to see less blandness and sameness and even more variety. So, and I think we're headed in that direction. I think it seems, it seems inevitable. I, you know, as, as traditional news consumers get older, as we've said before, the people who are replacing them are going to demand much more variety and I think more individuality. And I think that, you know, that's an opportunity for people in this room, both as consumers and as journalists. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Webb. My question is that... Just in your lecture here in general, and in a lot of classes I've taken in Cronkite, they try and um, pre pressure the point that you need to be as objective as possible and be transparent. But 
yet more and more people are kind of turned off by the concept of reporting because it's gotten kind of the more cynical outlook of already that so many um, news outlets are biased to begin with. So how do you think that's kind of come to term that more and more modern journalists are being told to be as objective and straightforward as possible, but yet more and more people also believe that the media is biased in what everything they say? I think one reason people think the media is biased, I think that the notion of media bias, I don't want to dismiss it, but I think it's exaggerated. And I think one reason for that is we now have the ability, it's not necessarily a good thing for the democracy, to cocoon ourselves in complacency and only the sources that agree with us or that give us you know, the news as, news as we see it. So once you can do that, it's very natural to think that, okay, well, I, this is my warm bath of news. Everything else feels bad to me. So the tendency is to say, well, this is fair and that's biased as opposed to this agrees with me and that, well, I agree with this and I don't agree with that. So I don't think, you know, again, there's no simple solution for this. We talked earlier to your colleague about more transparency. I think, again, I like, I, I'm not against the word objectivity, but I think if, if people are cynical about that, let's try using the word fairness. Let's try using the word fair and open to really um, an eclectic and kind of generous view of your news sources. So you're not just making your mind up what the story is beforehand and going out and illustrating that. You're actually saying, oh, first, so like two stages, I'm gonna go find out what I can find out without fear or favor. Let me go see what's going on out there. And then you'll have an array, a, a set of facts you can marshal to make your argument. And again, the, the beauty of it is increasingly, you're not just gonna have transparency like what we talked about before, which is, yeah, I'm, I'm married to an, an anti-abortion activist. The other kind of transparency is the news gathering process itself will increasingly be laid bare. And people are going to be able to check very easily. Look at all the links in stories now. You can, you know, if you want to and have the time, you can go back and check and see what the sources are for yourself. And you can say, you know what? I like this reporter, but she didn't do a great job here because I went back to look at those sources and I don't, that's not the conclusion I would have drawn. There's gonna be less and less behind this Wizard of Oz-like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, and a much more open news environment, which is gonna make this notion of bias, I think, uh, less prevalent. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name's Sean Holstage, and excuse my voice. <clears throat> I was, um, I'm an old print guy, so I was struck by a couple things you said. Um, one was, you protect your core and you go for more. And the other was, that we, the, the stuff that we don't like is generally, the coverage we don't like is generally driven by marketing and self-censorship trying to pander to that or accommodate that market. Self-censorship for commercial reasons. For commercial for, reasons. Meaning not the corporation doesn't want me to say this, no, 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 but people right. won't watch this. Right, and so it struck me as, in my career in watching this unfold that some of those things are in conflict. I'm wondering how you would reconcile those conflicts as we try and deal with this fragmented market and try and find new audiences, that cohort wants one type of coverage. The traditional cohort wants a different type of coverage. There are different levels of sophistication, for lack of a better word. So how do you see us reconciling those differences and still being relevant and still being vital to democracy? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a valid question, and it's actually Mark asked it earlier, you know, will it, can a mainstream organization do it? You know, can you have, within the same company, you know, a fairly traditional products, and fairly traditional products and platforms that still appeal to you know the large number of baby boomers and people who like things that way, while also creating this other kind of news that we've been talking about that's more disruptive and finding a way to pay for that. You know, whether you whether it's subscription or branded content or traditional advertising, which is very very problematic on digital platforms for reasons that we can talk about if you want to. So whether one whether you know, whether a company can do it, and a traditional media company can do it, or whether it's going to be, you know, socially driven companies like Facebook or Twitter or some of these upstarts that actually, you know, become the news giants of the future, uh, we don't really know. I do think that um, social media is a giant force that is, again, going to, I mean, for, for several reasons. You know, one is, it really replaces editors uh, to a large degree as the selectors of what's important because you're just as likely to 
we're more likely to rely on your friends to point things out to you. So, and, 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 it, and it breaks down the traditional structure of a newspaper or a TV show because it, to use the jargon of the consulting world, it disaggregates it into its pieces. So you, you might, you probably don't check, you know, the British newspaper, The Guardian, every day as The Guardian. You don't go to its website, which you could do, but you read stories from The Guardian when they show up on your Twitter, Twitter feed or on Facebook or post it on Facebook, and that's how you consume um, a, a ton of news. So I think to me, I, I th the real issue is going to be paying for this. I think it's what your question goes to as well. It's the, we're, we're, we're headed for, you know, much more variety, much more choice, much more information available to people who want it. But in that fragmentation, it was, you know, these oligopolistic structures paid for the news as we've come to know it. And to some degree, they're crumbling. We don't know what's going to replace them. Thank you. All right, Andrew, we are actually out of time, but I want to give you the last word. Is there any last thought you want to pass along before we say goodnight? No, just, you know, I, um, I, I, I remember uh, I, one of the classes I took in college um, was a, an advanced Russian class. I had some Russian in my background, and so I was, everybody else was a, a graduate student. So I, I was an undergraduate. Everybody else in the class was a graduate student at a very, you know, at a pretty high level. And the teacher was a, a, a teacher of literature, uh, a very formidable Russian woman, like from Central Casting, you know, he's kind of, you expect her to be like a Bond villain or something. And uh, she, uh, and there's a very, very famous Russian work of literature called Eugene Onegin, written by Pushkin. And at one point, one of the graduate students, a woman in the class, admitted she had never read it. And this would be, I don't even know what the equivalent would be. It'd be as though you were in an English class and said, oh, I've never heard of Mark Twain or... Who's Charles Dickens? I mean, she's never read, this is the fundamental work in Russian literature. So there was this shocked silence in the class. And everybody thought, okay, this James Bond villain, she is going to take this student's head off. We, like, we don't even want to be here to see what happens next. And instead, the teacher said, you never read Eugene Onegin? I envy you. <laughs> and that's how I feel about you. I envy you because you were coming into journalism in the most amazing time. There's a tremendous variety of experience. It's going to be, you know, that if it's scary to you, that it's going to be more up to you than it was to me, because for me, there was one path up the mountain. Don't let it be scary. It's exciting. And you also have the ability, thanks to social media and digital media, to connect with like-minded people anywhere in the world on stories that you're doing, on things that you're interested in. You have the ability to form your own networks that will be very, very powerful. So even though we're dealing with uncertainty, it's uncertainty in the interest of a much more interesting, compelling, and ultimately, I think, valuable news environment. So congratulations. I envy you. <laughs> All right. Andrew Hayward, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank